the Road is proudly sponsored by GE Johnson Construction Company, Charles J. Murphy, Gray Line of Colorado, Laura and Brian Markovich, Elham and Edward Ketchum, Wendy and Mark Pfeiffer, and viewers like you. Honeybees, they go about their busy day collecting pollen and nectar, while the rest of us are fairly oblivious to what they are doing. All we know is that we don't want them buzzing around us. But did you know that honeybees are disappearing? It's true. And on this episode of Hitting the Road, we're going to take the sting out of their reputation as we take you into the hive literally to meet the queen herself. And we're going to learn more about these tiny creatures and the huge impact they're having on our environment and on our economy. This show is set to be The Bee's Knees. I'm hitting the road again. Got adventure crawling under my skin. Going places that I've never been. I'm hitting the road. I'm hitting the road again. Going to take along all of my friends. Living life like it's just no end. I'm hitting the road. Feeling better since I don't know. We start our journey by buzzing around Boulder, Colorado and talking with the Bee Whisperer who will introduce us to Her Majesty the Queen. Then we'll forage for some nectar and pollen at the Denver Botanic Gardens. After that, we'll swarm over to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and get the scoop on the science of Apis mellifera. Finally, we get our just desserts by visiting a nutritionist in Colorado Springs and whip up a yummy but healthy snack featuring, you guessed it, honey. No bees were harmed in the making of this episode. The same, however, cannot be said of the human participants. Tim Broad, owner of Highland Honeybees, is a commercial beekeeper. He's been collecting bees his entire life and his apiaries are now helping farmers raise more abundant crops. Tim takes us inside the hive where we'll learn more about these four winged pollen and nectar collecting marvels. I keep bees all throughout Boulder County and as a general statement I have about 16 to 18 locations that have anywhere from 20 to 25 apiaries just like the one we're at here. You never want to keep bees all in one spot because it's too much of an impact for the area. There's not enough food to have lots and lots of bees in one place. Apis milliferia, the honeybee, they live these very short intense lives and as a general statement with the exception of the queen, the bees will maybe live four to six weeks. And uh, the bees are uh, hatched after 20 days, and the first thing they become is house bees, and then there's jobs where they're nurse bees, where they're just their job is to take care of and feed the young larvae. Then they uh, become uh, guard bees. From guard bees, they'll then go out and become field bees. And field bees' job is to go out and to collect the nectar. So in these very short, intense lives, they'll go through all these huge, one, biological uh, changes, and then also uh, very serious job descriptions. So we are, you and I, are gonna walk over uninvited to a hive with say, what, 40,000 bees? Yes, yeah, so we're gonna walk over to some bees, some unsuspecting bees, and we're going to give them a little knock and tell them we're coming, and then we'll open up the hive and take a little tour through there. And take some of their food. And we'll give, we'll have, of course, we'll have a little taste of honey because that's one of the, the, the gifts and benefits of being a, a beekeeper. Are the bees necessarily happy about this? So bees are natural hoarders, mm -hmm. and so their job is to collect as much food as possible when they can. This time of year, you know, we're getting to the place where there's soon there's no more food, so bees can be a little frantic around it. But uh, they're, the bees are more than willing to let us have a taste. My process in dealing with bees is typically to run around flailing my arms and screaming like my head's on fire. While it may be entertaining uh, <laughs> for us viewers, or it's not the appropriate response, it's not good for you and it's very scary. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to give a little smoke to the hive first, and then I'm going to give it a a little puff on the inside there. And what that does is that's one, telling the bees that we're coming. And then secondly, uh, begins to change some of the pheromones. I'm gonna go ahead and crack this lid. And as I crack it, I'll just go ahead and give it a little puff of smoke also. Okay. Wow. And then you can see, there's the hive. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open these up and take a look inside what's going on first. And we're going to, one, investigate 
how much honey is in here, but also the health of the hive. So on the edge of the hive, like this right here, is primarily where bees store their honey. And you can see, this is a solid frame of honey right here. And uh, let's move there, sweethearts. Let's move a little way a little bit. Tim, working with bare hands, shows me just how gentle here. honeybees really are. This light colored honey, or it looks very wet. Right. So that's shake. And what's referred to as shake is that's fresh nectar that's been collected. But the bees are now depositing there. And then be, and what they're going to do, now they're going to work to dry it. And then when the honey has been reduced to probably 16, 17% moisture, they'll then cap it. And capping it means they'll take these wax and they'll cover it. And now this is, will last for, oh, four to 6,000 years. All right, so here, for example, moving towards the center, and you can see there's a small bowl here. All this right here, those are eggs. And it takes 20 days from the time an egg is laid to larvae to hatch. So, and at day 10, it gets capped. So we know these are at least 10 days old, the parts that's capped. And then looking around it here, you can see different age. I'm gonna give them a little puff of smoke so they'll move a little bit. And can you see those little teeny white dots that are inside there? Yes. So those little teeny white dots are brand new eggs that were just laid today. So what we know about this hive is that the queen is doing well. She's laying, there's a good pattern here. We have, she laid in the center here, then moved to the edge, and then she's laying again outside here. So in all honesty, as a beekeeper, I don't need to do really anything more with this hive. It's in good shape. It's in good shape. All right, so here we have a forger here. And you know the expression, bees' knees? Yes. Well, where that expression comes from is that bees, they collect pollen and push it down to pollen sacs on their knees. So as happy as bees' knees, what that refers to is the fact that they can collect pollen. You know, one of the issues that's going on in the modern world right now uh, and why there's such pollinator collapse going on is that bees' immune systems are being hurt. Since the late 90s, there have been new generations of types of pesticides that are being used called neonicotinoids. And neonicotinoids are a type of a very insidious systemic pesticide that are not just sprayed on many plants, but are also coated on seeds. So the queen is larger, and it can be a time looking for like a needle in the haystack. Oh, there she is. Okay, so here's the queen right here. You mm. see her? You see how oh, she's longer yeah. and darker? Shall we indulge ourselves with a fresh taste of honey? Let's do it. All right. Let's see if there's a little bit of honey in here where we can take it. There has to be a reward for facing one's fears. There's lovely uh, late season honey. I'm gonna give you a, a slice of that right there. Look at that nice color. That is wonderful. So this honey tastes better than any grocery store honey for a number of different reasons. The most important reason is that honey is actually a very simple yet robust product and never should ever be heated above the natural temperature of the hive. When you take honey and heat it, which is often done in the processing of honey, it destroys all of the very subtle floral flavors to it. Keeping bees seems very romantic. But like any uh, romance, that's not any relationship, it's not the romance that sustains you. It's really hard work and tenacity. So you need three things. One, you have to get bees from a reliable source. You have to choose what kind of equipment you're going to use, and there's different kinds out there with pros and cons. But then thirdly, you really want to take a class from somebody who can help give you the foundations. In spite of the hard work and the long hours, for beekeepers like Tim Broad, harvesting honey is still one sweet job. To make my garden more honeybee friendly, I decided to buzz by the Denver Botanic Gardens and get some advice from horticulturist Sonia Anderson. Yeah, um, if you want to attract and support bees, you want to plant flowers that are that have a high nectar content, um, that have good pollen content, um, and particularly for honeybees, um, they need a, honeybees don't hover, 
and collect nectar like the way that hummingbirds do. They can hover and then, you know, and collect the nectar from the flowers, but honeybees need to land. So they need a flower that has uh, some sort of a surface landing platform. Um, so that's often like open shaped flowers like cone flowers where they can land on the cone or uh, penstemons or snapdragons um, where they have like a big lower lip on the flower so they can land on that and then crawl in and get the nectar. Um, so shape is important, um, nectar content is important, color is important. Uh, bees don't see red and so they're attracted to flowers that are white, yellows, purples, blues. Um, and scent is also important. Bees smell, and so they're attracted to scent. Um, they're attracted to sweet fragrances or minty fragrances, and bees forage during the day, um, unlike some pollinators that forage at night. And so they want flowers that are open during the day, and they like to be in the sun. They like to be in the warmth of the sun, so they usually go after flowers that are in sunny locations. And how important are the bees to your flowers? They're very important. As people talk about honeybee decline, you hear a lot about the importance of honeybees when it comes to agriculture and food production, mm -hmm. and that is extremely important. But bees are also just basically important to the sustaining of our ecological systems. I mean, bee pollination is how a lot of plants reproduce, um, produce seed for new plants so that they can continue to live and also maintain a certain amount of genetic diversity, which is very healthy for plants and for ecosystems. So if I'm going to plant a garden and I want to attract bees, what should I plant? <laughs> <laughs> you want to try to provide food for the bees throughout as much of the season as possible. It's really easy to provide food in the middle of the summer because lots of things are in bloom, um, but it's a little trickier. You have to plant a little bit more if you're trying to do like spring food or late fall food, um, but some of the some of the best uh, plants, one of them is uh, something that's called bee balm or monarda, um, and that is actually a great plant for all pollinators because bees will visit, uh, hummingbirds will visit it, butterflies will visit it, um, but it is a really good plant for bees, which is why it's called bee balm. Any other advice on bees? and? Well, um, one thing is that you definitely want to minimize your use of pesticides in your gardens. Even if you're spraying for, you know, those nasty wasps that, you know, sting so bad, you're also still uh, potentially going to be getting the bees as well. Yeah. So, so the most important thing, I think, to take away from this is that to keep bees alive, to keep them going, and all pollinators, as well as honeybees, is plant as much as you can, mm -hmm. and prolific flowers, keep them going seasonally, mm -hmm. and definitely have milkweed and bee balm yes. in your garden. Yep. So, is that right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and try to try to hold off on those pesticides. And hold off on those pesticides. <laughs> so it's good, good. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, you're yeah. welcome. Entomology is the study of insects and their relationship to humans and the environment. Dr. Frank Krell is curator of entomology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. As a child, Dr. Krell was always bringing home all sorts of little creatures to study and got serious about his bug collection at the age of 10. Fast forward a few years and he receives his PhD from the University of Tübingen, one of the oldest and most prestigious universities in Europe, and he follows that up with postdoctoral studies in West Africa. So, out of almost 1,000 species of bees found here in the Rocky Mountains, guess how many are actually hundreds? Honeybees. There's just one. Just one honeybee. Just one, because honeybees are not native to the New World. They were brought by people. 
The history of honeybees is that they produce honey and people found that out very early on. So we have um, indications from uh, paintings in caves of the Neolithic, so 8,000, 10,000 years ago, that people used honey, took honey from wild honeybees. Greeks and Romans used domesticated bees to produce honey for consumption and explorers have even found honey in the tombs of ancient Egypt. But it wasn't very sustainable. In their quest for honey, the ancients would destroy the bee colony, causing the bees to have to construct a whole new hive in which to live and work. But the honeybees originally lived in hollow trees. Uh, so people found that and cut out these pieces of tree and took them home with the bees and the bees could use it again but still destroyed the colony when they harvested the honey. It took a while to change that to a more sustainable use of the honeybee. Dr. Krell explains that it was the invention of the reusable frame in the 1800s that made sustainable honey harvesting possible. These wooden frames were invented that could be hung into a beehive uh, where the honeybees could produce the honey in and then they could be removed without destroying the whole colony. So that was a very, very nice invention for the bees. We have three castes of honeybees, only three. We have the queen, then we have... Dr. Krell goes on to explain, we also have the worker bees. Unfertilized eggs become drones, and fertilized eggs become worker bees. The sole purpose of the drones are to mate with the queen. They do not have stingers, and because they are of no use in the winter, they are kicked to the curb in the autumn. The worker bees are all females and have a lifespan of around six weeks during the summer and four to nine months during the winter. In the span of those six weeks during the summer, the girls will take on various jobs depending on their age. These jobs include housekeeping, nursemaid, construction worker, undertaker, and they also act as air conditioners, flapping their wings inside the hive to keep it cool and to help dry out the honey. Their final job is to forage for nectar and pollen. They send their old people out. They, <laughs> when they are young, then, because if they send the young bees out, the young bees can still serve in, in the hive, and getting out of the hive is dangerous. There are predators outside, or they can get lost, or they can get into a rain shower, and just get damaged or die there. So it's, it's pretty dangerous getting out of the hive. So explain to me what a swarm is. A swarm is when part of the colony or the whole colony finds that the place where they are uh, it's no longer suitable and they have to go somewhere else and then they go out or if a second queen is produced um, then a part of the colony follows that second queen, flies away with the queen and goes to some place where they can live. How do they tell each other where the, the nectar is? Well, they have this waggle dance. They know, they orient themselves on well, the position of the sun and they register the distance. They fly back to the hive and tell their fellow bees in the hive uh, where it is by a dance. It's all crowded, all crammed there. So the bees around the one bee that knows where the food is, the bees around that bee feel the dance. And, and understand it and then fly there in groups. It's hard to believe that something that tastes so sweet can also be good for you. Honey comes along with some amazing health benefits. We end our journey at Penrose Hospital in Colorado Springs with registered dietitian Malena Bjorkland. Is all the honey that you buy in a grocery store really honey? It's actually not. So the FSN did a study in 2011 that discovered that 75% of the honey that's sold in grocery stores is actually not real honey. So in order for it to be considered real honey by USDA honey standards, it has to at least have some pollen in it to have some health benefits for people. So 75% of the stuff that you buy in grocery stores is actually not real honey. How can we check to be sure it is? 
Is it on the label? So it's actually not going to be on the label as far as pollen content of the honey, but the way that you can really make sure that you're getting those health benefits of the honey is to make sure that you're buying either raw or comb honey. It's actually illegal for them to put raw or comb honey through a pasteurization process, which can kill all of those great microbes that are going on in the honey. Um, and that is what makes it so health beneficial for us. So buying raw or buying comb honey is really the only way to guarantee that you're getting those health benefits. What are some of the health benefits of honey? Bees will actually go around the area that you're in and collect the pollen from the different plants that are causing those allergies for people. So having that local pollen in your honey can actually help you build up an immunity against the allergies that you might get from that pollen. So the bees have to be raised in your area, is that correct? Yes. So that's something great to note too, is that if you don't know your beekeeper, you don't know your honey. So if you know that your beekeeper is raising bees around you within a 70 mile radius, you know that those are the pollens that are going to be affecting you during allergy season. So on the same note of knowing your beekeeper in order to know your honey, if you're looking for organic honey, you have to know that your beekeeper is raising those bees on an organic farm that's not being treated by herbicides or pesticides because otherwise there's really no guarantee that those bees have stayed in a contained area that hasn't been treated or hasn't been genetically modified as far as the crops that they're foraging. Okay. So in order to guarantee that you're having that organic honey, you have to know your beekeeper and you have to know where those bees are coming from. Why can't you give honey to a child under one year old? So very rarely it can contain bacteria that can actually cause a very rare foodborne illness within babies. Um, their gut flora is not necessarily mature enough to be able to fight off the botulism that can come from a spore that could be in that honey, especially raw honey. So you don't want to feed that to an infant that's under one year old for that reason because it can be very dangerous. So what if a person has diabetes, uh, can they have honey? They absolutely can. So diabetics, um, often people who don't have diabetes or even people who do are under the misconception that they cannot have carbohydrates, they cannot have things with sugar in them, but they can. The point of diabetics is being able to spread that carbohydrate intake out throughout the day and moderating the amount that you're taking in. So keeping it with a variety and being able to incorporate all of the other healthy carbohydrates with that honey, you can absolutely still have it if you're diabetic. So if I cut myself, I've heard that if I put honey on it, it'll actually heal it. Is that true? That's true, actually. So it's an antifungal and antibacterial. Um, so you can actually go ahead and apply that to your cuts, your scrapes, your burns, and it'll help to heal it because it's all natural properties. Oh, that's cool to know. Yeah. Very good. So I know that we wanted to go downstairs and do some cooking um, and kind of some recipe assembly with something with honey. So do you have any food issues? Well, I'm a vegan and most vegans don't eat animal products, but I do eat honey. So I'm guessing that makes me a vegan. I like that. <laughs> so what are we going to make today? So we're actually gonna make a snack that's very easy to assemble. It doesn't involve any cooking, so you really make sure you get all of those great benefits that the honey has to offer. So we're gonna throw together some strawberries, banana, granola, and some honey on top of it. You just mix it all together. It provides a really great snack, quick energy. So um, that's what we're gonna be making. It sounds yummy. Okay, Donna, so this is a kitchen. I know it might not look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But we are going to um, chop up some banana and then we're going to chop up the um, strawberry as well as add some granola and then put some raw honey in there for those health benefits. Okay, good. So this is a knife. Okay. I want you to be very careful with it. <laughs> I will. What am I cutting so, up? You are going to cut up some strawberries and I am going to cut up some banana and then we're just gonna put that in there and mix it all together. So with the strawberries, we have um, some great antioxidants as well as some fiber in the seeds. So um, that offers some health benefits as well. And then with the banana, we have some great potassium. So again, with the quick energy, but also we have some other great health benefits to it as well. Okay. Oh, that's pretty, isn't so, it? It is. It's very pretty. It's very colorful. And the more color that you have to your plate or your dish, the more nutrients you're getting. So it's another neat trick to be able to um, kind of gauge how nutritious your dish or your meal is. Okay. So we're just gonna take some of this granola, sprinkle it in there. We have some honey. Would you like to do the honors? Sure. <laughs> how much honey do I put in? Um, you can just put in a spoonful and just drizzle it over. 
just like this? Absolutely, and then we can just mix it all together. Cooking's pretty easy. I know. <laughs> Much easier than you thought, right? <laughs> so um, this is gonna be that raw honey that's also having those health benefits. So making sure, again, that you're reading the label to your honey and making sure that you know where your honey is coming from okay. so that you can um, reassure yourself and reassure your family, too, that you are having the health benefits coming from that honey and it's not just a sugar source. Perfect. Okay. All right. So we can dish some up and try it ourselves. So this is the fun part. This is the best part. <laughs> All right. So. Cheers. Cheers. Mmm. <laughs> Really, really good. good. <laughs> and not too sweet. Not too sweet at all. <laughs> yeah, I like that. It's amazing those little bees make such a wonderful treat. Absolutely. I agree. It's definitely the bee's knees. <laughs> I'm hitting the road again. Got adventure crawling under my skin. Going places that I've never been. I'm hitting the road. I'm hitting the road again. It's just no end. I'm hitting the road. Feeling better since I don't know when. I'm hitting the road. Road is proudly sponsored by G.E. Johnson Construction Company, Charles J. Murphy, Gray Line of Colorado, Laura and Brian Markovich, Elham and Edward Ketchum, Wendy and Mark Pfeiffer, and viewers like you.